Hey guys, welcome back to A Different Atheist Reads, A History of God with Karen Armstrong, or by Karen Armstrong. I'm Christy, and we are ready to move on to the middle section of chapter one. Now, before I get too much farther in this video, I just want to first um, clarify something that I spoke to in my last rant video. I'd like to take just a few minutes to expand on that point and connect it up a little bit better. Then what I want to do is review very briefly the attributes of the Babylonian and Canaanite gods and where Karen left us last time so that we kind of reorient ourselves to where the story is going. Then I want to try to give you a way to more intuitively understand the expanse of time that we're dealing with in the book when we're covering this period of the Babylonian Canaanite and early emergence of the what becomes the religion of Judaism and I've I'll explain that when I do it but um, I've created sort of like a just a kind of like a lagged variable maybe is not the best way to describe it but it's 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 a pegged measure so that we can get a more meaningful idea of distance of time like how far it is between these literary developments. Then then I want to uh, look into what Karen starts to discuss in her section, second section, and that's going to mostly deal with the authorship. She is also going to focus on the earliest characters of the Bible, and in particular on Abraham and Jacob. And then in my next, um, after my next rant video, we'll move on to the third part of chapter one, which is going to be Moses, and then we'll review Greeks, uh, the contributions of uh, Plato and Aristotle, I believe, are the major people that she's interested. So that's what we're going to do um, in this video and where it's going to go in the next one. So let's start with a clarification. In my last video, I talked about the linguistic basis for Karen's assumption that people took things metaphorically or mythically and not scientifically or meant meaning them as an accurate description. And I talked about it a little bit with the lack of abstraction in ancient Hebrew, the fact that there is um, there are no in, um, there are no abstract concepts of good or bad, but I use the example of function as to work properly and dysfunction to not work properly. But what I did not do is really connect that back to why this is a challenge for Karen in terms of her literary claims. And I want to also thank uh, Maple Leaf who pointed this out and asked this question. And when Maple Leaf posted this on the on my comments, it made me realize I needed to clarify this. So thank you, Maple Leaf. I always appreciate good questions and clarification questions because I clearly have an idea of my head of what I want to talk about, but I don't always get it out correctly. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to clarify this for you and for the other viewers. Right, so um, I talked about how we have a lack of abstractions in ancient Hebrew. And perhaps a really nice way to illustrate this is to just compare how we read the first two lines of Genesis with our Greek-influenced abstractions, and then look at a, compar a comparative translation done from directly from the ancient Hebrew into English, which contains no abstractions. And I think you might get a sense of why it's very difficult to make claims about what people saw in the text and what was meaningful to them. So. What I'm using here is the New Revised Standard Version of Genesis because according to the internets, that is the most reliable one, the one that scholars would use. And you're going to be familiar with the poetry of this language, so, you know, get ready for this one. Um, uh, and then we'll see how it changes when we take away all the abstractions and what the ancient Hebrew looked like. So, from Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the faces of the waters." Right, so that's um, our modern version, our modern translation that goes through the Greek from the ancient Hebrew. Now from the mechanical translation, and really put aside your preconceptions and just oh, listen as if you were sat around a fireplace or a campfire in the middle of the desert trying to keep warm while someone is telling you this story. In the summit, Elohim fattened the sky and the land, and the land had existed in confusion and was unfilled, and darkness was upon the face of the deep sea, and the wind of Elohim was fluttering upon the face of the waters. So you see here, it doesn't say in the beginning, it says in the summit, 
And again, this, using the term correctly and consistently, summit here means it can either mean the head of a river or the top of a mountain or the choicest meats. So the highest, the best, the starting thing. So in the beginning is close, but it doesn't really encompass the totality of the ancient Hebrew word. And then we have Elohim fattened the skies and the land. So it's not that God created these earth. Elohim did not create the skies and the land. The skies and the land existed and he goes and fattens them up. And the word here fatten literally means the same thing as like preparing a turkey. You want to make it, you know, when you're going to fatten a sacrifice, your intention is to plump it up so that it's very pleasing. And here again, we have Elohim fattening the skies and the land, you know, making them bigger. And the land had existed in confusion and was unfilled. So here the land had existed um, and was in confusion and unfilled and darkness was upon the face of the deep sea. You can literally see sort of the face of the deep sea. And the wind of Elohim was fluttering upon the face of the waters. So how you could get to say that that's either purely metaphorical, purely uh, not metaphorical, purely mythical and not intended at all to be an accurate description it does use concrete language. We can f Im imagine it happening. So this is the, the problem I had in terms of abstraction and concretes and us sort of retroactively imposing our bifurcated worldview on these texts. When I'm not entirely convinced these people had a bifurcated worldview. I think, that, you know, the, and the fact that this is not a bifurcated worldview from, you know, ancient times, I think is evidenced by the fact that when science, scientific, um, Discovery started to demonstrate the Earth was not the center of the universe. People freaked out. So um, clearly, they were not me only taking it as a metaphor and not as a serious description. And so, anyway, now um, moving on to the pre-rent video, just to remind you where we started. We had the Babylonian and Canaanite god stories, and we looked at those because they are highly influential to what will eventually become Judaism. Now, to give you a sense of the time between when the Babylonian texts emerge and when the Canaanite texts emerge and then when the Jewish texts, what becomes Judaism, the text for that starts to emerge, um, what I've done is I've taken the time frame from the before the Common Era, and I use BCE, before the Common Era, and CE, Common Era, to again not privilege Christianity, um, which uh, you have to assume a Christian worldview for before BC and, and AD, in the year of our Lord. So I'm using um, the historically accurate and religiously neutral terms of BC and BCE. So uh, we start off in um, the emergence of these Babylonian texts. I think um, 1750 BCE. And then we have a, another wave a few hundred years later, and then the, we eventually have what are coming out of the text in the ancient Hebrew. So what I've done is subtracted 214 from 1750, so that it pushes it back in time, and then every time there's another year I subtract that, so you can kind of get a sense of the space that civilizations and ideas and people lived and died and events happened between these waves of literary development. Now because Karen doesn't consistently put dates in her book when she's talking about these things, the dates that I'm using are actually coming from Evidence's video on the history of God, his review of uh, Karen Armstrong's first two chapters or so of A History of God. So you can um, look at that to see the dates that I used. I'll put a description in the link box, as always, and you can check that out because, again, it's a very good video series. But I'm just using his dates because, again, Karen isn't per really, really um, super precise on where she puts her, um, her dates in terms of her chapter. So if we have 1750 BCE and we subtract 2014 from that, that becomes the year 264. And that's basically what I'm saying. If we go back 1750 years, what was going on that we can recognize in our cultural development? And by our, I'm going to be totally honest, I'm talking about Western European culture because I speak English and that's my influence. So if you are watching from the Middle East or China or someplace in Africa or other places where you have a similar timeline that you could use to do this little thing. Um, I'm really sorry I didn't do one that was 
entirely universal and comprehensive but it is kind of like my hobby and I'm really good with English history in particular English and French history um, so I just play to my strengths so we're gonna deal mostly with Western European timelines with, we're gonna deal exclusively with Western European timelines and I'll be putting these dates um, in within the geography usually either like Roman or, or British so um, in so if we subtract that 1750 from 2014, what we get is year 264 CE. And this is when we first have the, the dating for the Babylonian writings. And at that time, was uh, between 250 and 299 was when the Roman Empire was being invaded by the Goths and the Franks. So we've got basically before um, Justinian and, and before all of that, we've got, that's how far back we're going. So let's say that we, we put that in the 200 to 299 CE. That's when we have um, the Babylonian writings. When's the next time we see something that makes a contribution toward this history of God? Well, we go through the Huns invading Europe. We get Western Europe, um, the empire disintegrating. The Vandals destroy Rome. Justinian comes back and becomes the Byzantine Empire uh, um, emperor. Muhammad, the founder of Islam, is born. And he also, the Muslim empire grows in the 600s to 649 CE. Then you've got the venerable, sorry, the venerable Bede, who is a famous um, historian who's writing in the... 650s to 99s. In the 700s, you get Charlemagne, and in 1771, Charlemagne becomes king of the Franks. And about this time, we start to get the Canaanite writings. So w the Canaanite writings come up in 1200 P BCE. When you subtract that back, it becomes 800 um, B 1814, and that's basically when Charlemagne is is uh, the German emperor. So from that time of, what do we have, uh, the Roman Empire being attacked but not even having Christianity as a religion yet, being the official religion, and moving all the way through to Charlemagne, that was the Babylonian influence, and now we get to the Canaanite influence, and that starts with Charlemagne. So then we start the next great wave, and what we have in between the Canaanites and the Hebrews are, you get Alfred the Great, the discovery of Iceland, Vikings discover Greenland, Eric the Red establishes a Viking colony in Greenland, and Macbeth murders uh, D uh, Duncan, the King of Scotland. Uh, and the next time we have any writings, or the first Jew Jewish writings we have, appear around 950 BCE, which puts us in 1064, which is when William the Conqueror invaded uh, Britain, or the, yeah, the UK, Britain, and started the Norman Conquest. So from Charlemagne to the Norman Conquest, Again, we have nothing from the Jewish authors. Um, we, going all the way back to sort of the start of Rome, we don't have anything from the Jewish authors. At the time when William, Duke of Normandy, um, was invading the Britain to establish the Norman Conquest, that's when we have the first Jewish writings. So I hope that perhaps gives you a greater sense of how long these civilizations were around and how pervasive their ideas were and how they could have traveled to really um, provide the true literary heritage um, all the way back to these the the creation myths and the, the flood myths and things like that it becomes I think a lot more plausible when you realize how long these stories existed before Judaism even appears last thing to review are the characteristics that we discussed in the previous video and again I'm going to do this very quickly the gods of the Babylonians and the Canaanites as we saw were temporal they were constrained and limited in their power, even mortal. They showed ignorance. They were spatial and geographical. They were located within a specific holy place for the people who worshipped them. They existed with other gods. It was polytheistic. They had a personal interaction with human beings, but they didn't have a personal relationship with human beings at this in this creation story. And they don't have moral claims on human beings. They have no moral obligations that they want to put on humans. Humans are created in the Babylonian myth for to be workers for the gods, not to be like their special creation. So Karen goes right from the Canaanite religion with its high god of El and Baal and Asherah, and she goes right into Abraham, kind of skips the first bits, and I'll explain why in a few minutes. But I do want to say that Karen makes a series of claims in this chapter that treat both Abraham and Moses as historical people and she doesn't provide any references for this 
And so I'm going to just flag, I know, I know I try to always present her stuff very charitably and from a neutral point of view, but I think it's irresponsible for me to present this and not mention that I don't see any substantiation for any of her assertions about the historicity of either Abraham or Moses. And in fact, in my critique, I'm going to present quite a lot of evidence to the contrary. So I just want to flag that up a little bit so that you care, you understand my perspective as we move forward. What Karen then does is mention the idea of multiple authors behind the first, the Torah, the first, first five books of the Jewish scriptures. And if you are kind of a already sort of amateur Bible scholar, you're probably, you know already about the documentary hypothesis. I'm going to put a link to a video, a really good video on this from, I think it's from the Yale course again. I have the hyperlink, but not the name. So you can go ahead and watch that. But she reviews the fact that during the 19th century, German biblical scholars developed a critical method for discerning what they identified as four in independent sources that um, make up the authorship of the first five books of the Bible. And that these uh, books are later collected into the final text of, of what we now know as the Pentateuch during the 5th century BCE. So if the final text from that period of like, William the Conqueror forward, um, 500 uh, BCE minus 214 puts us in 1514, and so you've got William the Conqueror was when the J and E sources appear. Um, when the books are actually collated and put together, Mona, um, sorry, Da Vinci is painting the Mona Lisa. So that's the amount of time that occurs between the first writings and the various waves of editing and, and collating and, and other things, and the, the version that we have today. So that's the time period. I find that helpful, so I hope you do too. She reviews in this chapter two authors, actually she might mention all three, the four of them, so I'll go ahead and mention the four of them. There's the J author because the J author tends to use the word Yahweh, and Yah in German is uh, a J. And so that's it's the Yahwehist, and then the, the other author is E, a second author is E, that is because the author uses the term Elohim rather than Yahweh when giving the name of God. There are the two other authors that are identified priestly, the priestly authors who are quite um, obviously it reflects their priestly values, and then there's also the Deuter Deuteronomist who is the author of, of the Deuteronom Deuteronomy. That's always, it always trips me up, Deuteronomy and Deuteronomic and, and that kind of thing. Um, and so she's going to talk more about those two authors, P and D, in the second chapter. And not that she really talks about J and E much in this one, but at least she makes more of a reference to them. Now, in terms of characterizing J and E, she talks about the fact that although the authors are clearly influenced by their pagan neighbors, you do start to see a, a very unique development, which is J's history of um, creation is very different from, it has similar elements to the, the Babylonian myth, but it does have some very important distinct characteristics. We should recall that the first text of Genesis is not Genesis 1-1. It actually starts, uh, the earliest text starts at Genesis 2, 5 through 7. The 1-1 one, one, I believe is a priestly author, not either J or E. So when people in the ancient world were hearing these stories for the first times, this was the way that it opened up, and I'll go ahead and, and read it. This is going to be from J, and so when the word Yahweh is used in the text, the translators translate it as Lord God, and that's different from Elohim, which I think is just God. But, so we've got the Lord God here because it's the Yahwehist. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground." So what Karen then says about this text is that basically Jay um, moves through prehistory and the mythical period. And I guess she considers that everything from its opening lines um, through the flood story and the Tower of Babel and then arrives at the start of history of the people of Israel, which begins in chapter 12, she says, with the man Abram, who will be later named Abraham, and he is commanded by Yahweh to leave his family uh, in Haran. So um, that's Karen's take. She just basically skips all of it and gets right to Abraham. So I'll leave you to decide how you feel about that in terms of a history of God and if you think that that was an appropriate way to approach the idea of a history of God is just knock all that stuff out and get right to Abraham, but that's what she does.
She points out here that what is quite unique about Abraham's, Abram's and then Abraham's relationship with God or Yahweh is that um, it is actually a personal exchange where as in the Canaanite religions and Babylon people didn't um, have gods interfering with their daily lives and, and have, hang, hanging out with them, coming by for dinner or ordering them to kill their kids and then changing their mind. Um, that didn't happen in those stories. So this is uh, clearly a, a new development. And then again, considering the amount of time that's passed, it's not like it's that revolutionary. I mean, these stories have been around for ages and you know, um, humans do intellectually evolve over this time period. So this is just a reflection of that um, in, um, development. She does point out a little weird kind of problem with the text here and that is that in the J account J says that men had worshipped Yahweh ever since the time of Adam's grandson but in the sixth century when the P author was writing P seems to suggest that the Israelis um, or these Israelites my, my apologies the Israelites had never heard of Yahweh until he appeared to Moses in the burning bush so P makes Yahweh explain that he was really the same God as the God of Abraham although this was rather controversial and he tells Moses that Abraham had called him El Shaddai and did not know the divine name of Yahweh so I think this is just um, I'm throwing this out there because I think it's kind of important to show that this is not a text that progressed in, in a linear way. We have people jumping in at different time points, and this is an example of where you get, you need a retcon, basically. <laughs> you need a retcon to, and that's what they do. They do a retcon and fix up, um, you know, how it is that these are the same gods, even though uh, it doesn't look like it. So there you go, biblical retcon. Karen also notes that we should not assume that either the character of Moses or the character of Abraham would have been monotheists in the way that we consider a monotheist today, but more likely that they were polytheists who had elevated one god. It is likely that Abraham's god was El, the high god of Canaan. The deity introduces himself to Abraham as El Shaddai, El of the mountain, or god of the mountain, which was one of El's traditional titles. Elsewhere he is called El Elyon, which means the most high god, or El of Bethel. So, again, uh, locating this creation story, these characteristics of God, this, this name even, right into the Babylonian and Canaanite religions and their own myths, rather than a divine revelation. So after doing a little comparison, comparing the, how God would appear to Moses in the midst of a volcanic eruption and people had to keep their distance and take off their shoes and, you know, be all like scared, um, Abraham's God, or Abraham's God El, his name, was very kind of mild and would like sort of show up as a friend or just kind of talk or, you know, was very interested in his reproductive life and whether or not he was going to be having babies, you know. So this is uh, two very different presentations of God. And that's, um, oh, she wants to mention one other thing, which is that when people had these interactions with a God, it's called an epiphany. So whenever a human being has a divine revelation, it's an epiphany, and then she uses this term epiphany to connect us with the next bit of her story where she jumps into Jacob, and Jacob having an epiphany multiple times in, in, in the course of, of the story. After his epiphany, Jacob decides to consecrate the holy place that he had had his epiphany in the way that pagans did at the time, according to Armstrong, which is taking a, a rock, uh, the stone, I'm sure he had used as a pillow, and upending it and sanctifying it with the libation of oil, and he would now call the place Beth El, or the House of El. And this just, again, demonstrates it's not a monotheistic religion at all. It really is incorporating the pagan beliefs in order to give birth to a monotheistic god. So these um, ideas then of epiphany and uh, the encountering of God is what um, Karen wants to discuss a little bit here. He talks about the fact that Jacob made the God he had met in, in his dream his own God, his own high God. I think the term is something about like monolateralist polytheism from the evidence uh, video, but it, Jacob basically has a sort of confirms the relation, relationship that um, God had, had made with Abraham in terms of making this covenant and in return for um, El's special protection then Jacob would make him his Elohim, the only God who counted so he was going to raise him above all other gods um, that he would worship and um, yeah 
And she goes on to do more about the how pragmatic religion is because if people would work adopt a conception of the divine that worked for them not because it's scientifically or philosophically sound. I think this phrase must come up at least once per chapter so far. Um, <laughs> maybe more often than that, maybe multiple times per chapter, but uh, there it is again. All right, to wrap this up, um, I'm just going to kind of finish very briefly by saying that um, to transition between Abraham and Moses, Karen kind of throws us in a, in a weird way back toward the sacrifice, um, uh, the binding of Isaac, and then making a parallel to Exodus. But what she basically says is that Abraham is a man of faith because he trusted that God would make good his promises even though they seemed absurd, um, and that this, however, turns sour when God makes the appalling demand that Abraham sacrifices his only son. And she writes, to our modern ears, this is a horrible story. It depicts God as a despotic and capricious sadist, and it is not surprising that many people today who have heard this tale's children reject such a deity. And then she transitions into Moses. So um, it's not a very satisfying closing in terms of like wrapping things up. So in order to provide closure, I have gone ahead and listed out the attributes that I've observed in the text when I look at the concepts of God, or the concept of God, and what are the elements, the attributes that are populating this in terms of the text that we've seen in this section of the chapter. And I would say that the attributes of God in this section uh, are that he is tempor temporal, that he is constrained, again, and has limited powers, he shows ignorance, he's spatial and geographical in terms of his limitations, he changes his mind, his character, um, and his motives over time. He exists with and among other gods. He's just the highest in, in these particular stories with the characters in the stories. He's a personal god and far more, far more of a personal god than we saw in the earlier stories in terms of the creation myth. I mean, a lot of I'm, it's it's interesting to me how much of Genesis is actually God inner, like God's obsession with women's women's reproduction, women being barren or not being barren, and God intervening in these very gynecological ways to in history um, you know God being really uh, concerned about who's giving birth to whom and um, and intervening intervening in that so he is quite a personal God he's almost an OBGYN uh, in Genesis and this is a God also that unlike uh, the God of, of, of J and E unlike the gods in the Babylonian um, writings that we have, he does have moral demands and um, moral commands, you know, like be fruitful and multiply, and why your brother's blood is spilled um, cries out from the ground to me in the, the murder, uh, the story of Cain and Abel. So he has got a moral dimension that these earlier gods do not have. He, um, I think, can show mercy and also be merciless. If you look at, you know, not killing, and not retrib in terms of the retribution of, in, in the Cain and Abel story, there isn't a death penalty. Um, otherwise, you, I guess you'd kill off the only two grown men besides Adam in the world, but, um, but at other times he's completely merciless. And I've also tried to come up with a good analysis here for, I see contempt on one side, but I don't see necessarily affection, perhaps loyalty. Um, loyalty to those who are loyal to him. So it's more, rather than love and hate, maybe it's an insider-outsider. Like who is with me is with me and who is against me is against me. So those are the characteristics of the God that I see, which make it quite distinct from what we saw in the wrap-up from the earlier part of this video, where the gods are still very distant and don't have a moral component and don't really seem particularly interested in the sexual activity of, of the people who worship them. So we are seeing an evolution of this god. More things are being introduced to probably address human needs and concerns, and also probably a developing society and interactions with other cultures. So that's where I'm going to leave it for this episode. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much, by the way, for subscribing if you have. And uh, I'm going to start working next on a video uh, called uh, Seriously, The Psychology of Atheism for my An Atheist Ask series. If that sounds intriguing, check it out. I hope to have it up um, by Halloween. And in that video, I'm going to be taking on a Freudian psychologist who asserts that people are atheists because of their, well, no, certain kinds of men are atheists. Men are atheists because of their daddies. Um, so yeah, uh, if you are looking for something more than the, the book series, I hope you check that out. And otherwise, I will talk to you guys next time when I will be ranting. So, see you next Thursday, and thanks for watching.
So Karen transitions from 